if you walk into a typical bookshop and you start looking at books on marketing, like how to make more money out of an online business, there are really two things they talk about. The first one is acquisition. So getting new customers, how do you um, generate leads and bring people along to your business, whether it's an online business or an offline business. And the other is conversion. So once you've got people actually in the door or looking at your website, how do you then turn them into customers? And so it's really quite a simple formula. Basically, acquisition plus conversion equals profit. This is what is taught in you know, marketing stuff all over the place. From a website point of view, that's really traffic plus conversion equals profit. So the more traffic you get, and if you can convert them, then you make more money. And the thing we hear all the time is the site owner says, I want my site to be at the top of Google. And we get that all the time. Um, as if we can click a little button and it happens. So, but what they're really saying is, I want lots of people to visit my website. Like, their objective is they want to bring in lots and lots of traffic. But what they say is, I want my site to be at the top of Google. So, AdWords is basically just a marketplace for buying traffic. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. If you want traffic on your site, you can use AdWords to simply buy traffic to your site. So, if you want 10,000 visitors on your website, no problem, you can do it. Spend some money on Google AdWords and you'll have 10,000 visitors on your website today. Um, but the thing is, this is what a lot of people miss. They say, we want lots and lots of traffic, but the thing is that what you do with the traffic is critical. It's no good just uh, bringing on lots and lots of people to your site if your site isn't operating efficiently. And if it's not set up to handle the load, you can't just <laughs> chuck a whole lot of people on it and expect to then make money out of it. It needs to actually be able to handle the load you put on it in terms of um, operating efficiently, having a high conversion rate, all that sort of thing. So if we go back to the traffic and conversion equals profit, another way to format that, traffic plus conversion equals profit, what this really should be is traffic times conversion times margin equals profit. So if you increase any one of those things, you increase your amount of profit. So traffic, you might have say 10,000 people visiting your site, conversion ratio you know, rate might be 5%, so multiply by 0.05. So you're making a margin of 10 bucks on whatever you're selling, then your profit is going to be $5,000. But if you can increase any of those numbers, so if you can increase your conversion ratio from 5% to 10%, you've made twice as much profit for the same number of visitors. So it's not just a matter of bringing on heaps of more traffic, it's a matter of making sure that the site is effective as well, and increasing all of those things as much as possible to get the biggest margin possible. So, this is where Google AdWords comes in. So we'll play spot the ads. And a lot of people, when you talk to them about Google, you say, you talk to them and say, you know, do you ever click on the ads in Google? And they go, ads, what ads? Um, there are actually ads in Google, in the Google results. And a lot of people don't realise, because it's just um, text up off on the side here, that's the really clever thing about it. Because it's formatted the way um, a normal organic search result is formatted, a lot of people simply see them as search results and they don't realise that someone's actually paid to be in that position, which means that they have a lot more credibility than something like a, a banner ad or some flashing thing that's you know, uh, running on the side there. So they end up having a relatively high click-through rate compared to banner ads on most other things. Um, so the other important thing is that AdWords ads are contextually relevant. So the ads themselves are not random. They're only displayed on the basis of keywords that someone has typed into a search. If someone is looking for particular keywords, you can then use that to display just ads that meet their particular needs. And this comes up, up to a, an important point, which is the search network versus the content network. And these are all the places that um, AdWords ads can be shown. The search network is anywhere that Google search results are displayed, typically on you know, Google results page. The content network is third party sites. So with the, um, the search network, someone has gone to Google, they've typed in a search term, they've got some results and they've got some ads down the site. Um, and it looks like what we were looking at before. But with the content network, you can actually have your AdWords ads placed on third party sites that have agreed to carry um, ads. So that, these are sites that have signed up for the AdSense program. And you typically see it on the bottom of blogs and things like that. People that might have a fair bit of traffic to their site and they're trying to make money from it by signing up to carry AdWords ads using the AdSense program. So is that the actual definition of AdSense then? That's right, AdSense is AdWords ads placed on a third party site. They're really two halves of the same system. So AdWords is advertisers trying to have ads placed. AdSense is site owners putting the ads on their site and they're, they're very complementary. So what you can see, once again, this is on the content network. Um, this particular um, screenshot is from my blog and, and on the pages of the blog, it's got 
you know, Linux and various things like that mentioned. And you can see that the ads themselves, like um, Linux Support Australia, um, Linux Training, have been tuned to the content. So even on third party sites, the keywords are very important and the context of the ads is important, which means that the click through rate goes up because if someone is looking at that site, they're probably interested in the things that the ads are going to be displaying. So before we get into actually setting them up, one thing you absolutely have to understand, a couple of terms, and these thing, terms get thrown around all the time, and if you don't understand them, you're stuffed basically. Um, CPC is cost per click. So this is how much um, the advertiser pays to Google each time the ad is clicked. Now this is different to the way banner advertising used to be done, which was usually um, in what was called um, yeah, in lots per thousand. So you would say, I'll pay five bucks to have my ad shown 5,000 times on a website. And it didn't matter whether it was, everyone clicked on it or nobody clicked on it, you still paid five bucks for those thousand impressions. With cost per click, if nobody clicks on your ad, you don't pay. So it, you're entirely paying for results, not for just stick my thing up there. And the other thing is click through rate. This is the, um, the complimentary term. The click-through rate is percentage of users that click on it. So if you've got a thousand displays and then hundred people click on it, you've got a 10% CTR. So the idea is that you want to be paying as little as possible for the CPC. So you don't want to be paying much per click, but you want the highest click-through rate possible. So for every time your ad is shown, you want as many people as possible to be clicking on it. So that raises the question of how Google ranks ads. And obviously on search results, they have to decide which ads or which results to show at the top but they also have to decide which ads to show at the top on the right hand side. And there are a few different things they use. Firstly, keyword relevance. So if you're searching for a search term, they will only show ads that match those particular search terms. And in a moment, we'll talk about how to set, how to associate keywords with particular ads. And this is where the, the marketplace thing comes in. The cost per click bid amount comes into it as well. So if you're willing to pay more per click, your ad will be higher up the result list. And AdWords is basically a big marketplace. It's an auction, essentially. You have a whole lot of people that want their ads to be shown for specific keywords, and they all say how much they want to pay. Someone might say, I'll pay 20 cents a click. Someone else will pay 30 cents a click. The person that's bid 30 cents will probably have their ads show up higher. The other person will still have their ads show up, but they'll you know, be pushed down the results a little bit. The thing is that Google wants to make sure that there is a very strong association between quality of the ads and the results though because they have a reputation for doing um, for doing really good work with search and making sure that the results exactly match you know searches search terms so they also factor in things like historical click-through rate if you put up an ad which performs really badly and it's got very low click-through rate even if you're bidding a very large amount for it that ad will then fall down the results so it's not just how much you pay but it's also how well it performs so that encourages people to write ads that are effective rather than um, just paying to have their ad displayed and not actually do anything useful with it. And the other thing is website quality. This is something that wasn't really factored in early on. Um, up until about mid-2006, website quality didn't really matter. So all of the analysis was done on the basis of the ad that was going to be placed. But when you click on an ad, it takes you to a website. And in uh, mid-2006, Google did an update to the algorithm which factored in uh, website quality. So if you had a, um, a site with a very high page rank, it would mean that your ads would automatically go higher up the results. And a lot of people overlook that. So one of the things you also have to do is look at the website that ads are going to direct people to and do some basic search engine optimization and make sure it ranks reasonably well. And then once a quality score has been assigned to an ad, um, that reflects which block it goes into. So down the side of the page, there are a sequence of ads and they are broken up by blocks. So the, there's the first three ads and then four to six and then seven to eight. So typically there are eight ads um, showing down the side of the page. And then um, the ads are then randomly placed within that block. They're associated with the block on the basis of those other factors. One of the, uh, the cool things about AdWords is that you can do tracking of multiple campaigns as well. So you can run a whole lot of different ads um, against each other and you can measure independently to see what they're doing. So what you can do is segment your ads and you can have um, different ads for different keywords or for geo-targeting. So you might have one set of ads that's for people within Australia. Um, so say for example, you had a business that had customers that were both within Australia but also traveling from overseas. What people coming from overseas are searching for might be quite different. 
so you might have ads with different keywords or whatever, or you might be willing to pay more for uh, people that are coming from outside Australia. So you can separate um, the display of your ads by you know, local and international or whatever criteria you like, um, and also by ad text, so you can have different um, ads, yeah, ads with different text displayed in them, and then you can measure response. So you can say, this particular ad text gets me a you know, 5% CTR, and this one gets a 3.2, so this is the better ad, and then you drop the, um, the less performing ad. So to get started, it's actually really, really simple. Um, just go to adwords.google.com, and you don't even have to sign in at this point. You can simply click on the Start Now button, and it takes you through the process. When you first start up, there are two options you've got. You can either use the Starter Edition or the Standard Edition. Um, basically, just choose Standard. The idea with the Starter Edition is that it simplifies a whole lot of things to make it really easy through the, um, the sign-up process, and then through once you've got the ads running, um, it's simpler to manage as well. But the problem is that it takes away a whole lot of features which are really useful. So don't bother with Starter Edition. Um, it cripples you too much. There are a whole bunch of things you can't do. So as you go through the Standard Edition sign-up, the first thing you have to specify is customer targeting. So you can target customers by language um, and by location. So you can specify a geographic region. Um, and you can choose multiple options at that point. So for example, you can specify, I want my ad to be shown to English-speaking customers and German-speaking customers, but that's just silly because you can't then segment the, um, the data from between the two of them. You really need to be able to track ads independently. So as you're going through the sign-up process, there'll be lots of places that you can choose multiple options, but don't, just choose one thing to start with. Keep it really, really focused. And then you can come back and add another campaign or ad group or ad or whatever later on to cover those other options. So the first ad itself, um, you just type in the boxes and there are some very stringent limitations on this. There's not really like much you can do. Basically the headline is a maximum of 25 characters, description um, two lines, 35 characters each, and a display URL, which is 35 characters. And that is all that people will see when they actually look at the ad. There's also the destination URL, so when someone clicks on the ad, that's the URL they'll go to, which can be up to 1,024 characters. Now the reason that the display URL and the destination URL are different is that um, typically what you would do is have just the address of your website as the display URL because it's nice and short in the ad, but the destination URL might go to a page deep within the site or you might want to add tracking code or something like that to it so you know where traffic came from, you know it came from this particular ad. So the destination URL can be really long, but people won't see all the, you know, the random string stuff on the end of it. So next you have to select keywords to be associated with this particular ad. Um, keywords themselves, well in the AdWords terminology, a keyword is actually like a key phrase. It's a, it can be a string of words, multiple words. So in this particular example, we've got AdWords help and AdWords guide as two different keywords. Um, and we'll get to how to select the keywords in just a moment. So next you've got to set your pricing information. First thing is currency, which is just how Google bill you. When your ads are shown, you get charged um, on the, the basis of the cost per click. So um, when they send you a bill, they can bill you in Australian dollars, or US dollars or whatever. It's got nothing to do with how you deal with your customers. Then um, you can specify the most that you would like to spend on average per day. So this is where you set a spending limit and you say, okay, I've got a budget of 10 bucks per day or 100 bucks per day or two, two bucks per day or whatever it happens to be. And that's like a, a safety net. So you won't spend more than that point. So you set the limit of how much you want to spend per day on your ads. And then Google will try to show your ads enough times to spend that amount of money. So once you've done that, just scroll down the page a little bit. There's a section for initial bid optimization. This is before the ads even been created. Uh, you can click on the, um, the estimate, the traffic estimation button and it runs a little bit of analysis over the ad that you've created and it compares it to historical information for other ads in the system. So you don't see any information about those ads, it just applies some magic formula in the background and comes back and says, on the basis of traffic volume for people searching on those particular keywords and the expected click-through rate, we think that you will get this number of clicks per day or this number of ad impressions per day. So they do a bit of prediction on the basis of um, of average performance of other ads. And <clears throat> you can tune things later, but this is a good way to do a little bit of tweaking before your ad actually goes live. 
and ultimately what you really need is live data with your real ad with real customers so that you know how to tune the ad but this just gives you a bit of a heads up before you get going and, and tells you whether you're being realistic with your bid, bid amount um, you might have some idea that you're going to bid the keywords at 10 cents a keyword and if it's a really competitive area a competitive market you might be paying two or three dollars per keyword and this tool will show you that you're nowhere near the mark and it will show you that um, your ad position you know won't fall into the top group or whatever does that take into account things like just specifying a region australia and language and yeah so that's on that. that's on the basis of the ad that you've specified yeah Good so all the data has been ended up to that point that's right that should be pretty accurate it should be reasonably accurate um, but of course a lot of it, the performance of the ad comes down to uh, well, they can do accurate estimations in terms of they know how many people are searching for certain keywords, so they know how many times your ad will be displayed. But you could write the worst ad in the world and it won't ever be clicked on, or the best ad in the world it will always be clicked on. Yeah, so so those, are, those are estimations. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're reasonably accurate. So then review selections is the next page. It basically just shows you the summary of what you put in so far and gives you an option of going back and changing any of those particular settings. And right at the end, this is the funny thing, you get to the end of this process and it asks you to sign up because up until now you haven't had to log in, haven't had to provide a username and password or anything at all. You haven't had to provide any personal information about you whatsoever. All you've done is define an ad. So you can go through all of this and play around with ads and things like that before you even register with the system. So if you already have a Google account, like if you have a Gmail account or Google Docs or something like that, you can simply sign in with that account and your AdWords, um, will simply be associated with that same account, or if you don't, you can create a new one. So once you're actually logged in and identified, you then need to submit payment information. So you have an, your first ad that's been defined, but it's not running yet, it's not live. And you need to tell Google how you want to pay for your ads. There are a couple of options for this. Um, ads can be either prepaid or postpaid. If you have a credit card or something like that, then it will be postpaid. So you put in your credit card information, they run the ads, they measure the actual amount that, um, you know, the number of clicks, they multiply that by the CPC that you bid, and they build your credit card. One of the things that they've done to make this attractive to businesses, because a lot of businesses have trouble paying for stuff like this online with a credit card, is you can actually pay by online funds transfer, but only as prepay. So you can transfer, say, $100 into the Google account, and you've got it then as credit, and you can spend it. Um, and that's the, um, the prepay option. So either way, once you've submitted payment information, the ads are released and that ad can start running. You can make that ad go live. So that's it. At that point, you've got an ad and it will actually be live and appearing on the, um, the Google network, on the search network at least. So then you need to look at how to manage the account. Like once it's out there, how do you look after it? First thing to do is have a look in the reports section. This has got a whole bunch of information in it. It takes a little while for the historical data to start building up but it keeps track of um, number of um, times your ad has been shown, number of times it's been clicked on, so it then calculates the click-through rate and various things like that. And you can look at detailed information like where customers are coming from and a whole lot of other things. So as your ad starts running, that's really useful and you can use that to start tuning uh, your ad performance. You can also link into Google Analytics. Now, this the thing is that AdWords is actually the way Google makes money. That's their single biggest revenue stream. When they released Analytics as a free service, um, Analytics basically is a way of providing very detailed information about visitor behavior on a website. So it records everything that the user does, what page they go to, what links they click on, how long they stay, all of that sort of thing. The reason they released that as a free service was to try to encourage people to use AdSense and AdWords. And Analytics itself ties into AdWords in a very uh, in, in a very tight way. And what you can do is have your analytics system linked to your um, AdWords account so that you can then track behavior of people that have come from specific ads. Um, one of the things you can do in analytics is specify um, goals. So say for example your goal, you have two goals on your website. One of your goals might be get people to sign up for my online newsletter. And what you do is in the, the goal definition you say if someone goes to this particular page um, which is the sign up page that's the first step in the sign up process and then if they get to the page where they've submitted the information which is the thank you page we know that they've completed that goal and you can do the same for your shopping cart so you can say 
um, okay, people want to buy things from my site, if they get to the point of the thank you page on the checkout after the shopping cart, we know that that goal has been achieved. Because of the tie-in with Google Analytics and AdWords, you can then link information about the, the ad all the way through to the goal achievement. So you can say, for example, I've got 10 AdWords ads that are running, and they might be in different markets or with different keywords or whatever. And you can look at the report on your goal achievement and say, of all the people that bought stuff on my site this week, this particular ad sent me the most people that actually ended up buying something. So you can track all the way from point of acquiring someone that's interested to an actual customer, which is really powerful because normally you don't have that link up. You know you've got customers, you know that customers are coming from these places, but you don't know which of those places is giving you the best value customers. So that's a really cool thing to look at. There's also a section for my account, which basically just is all of the financial. So that's um, anything that you might owe for your ads um, and things like that. <coughs> So campaigns, ad groups, and ads. This is a concept that is not explained very well in the AdWords interface. When you first log in, this can be really confusing because you can't figure out the difference between campaigns, ad groups, and ads. And basically, it's a hierarchy. It's a way of grouping things together. Um, campaigns are the top level grouping. So the, right at the top of your system, you have campaigns. And that defines um, the start and end date of, um, you know, of a group of ads and you can do things like set how much budget you want. So you can have one campaign with a budget of $10 a day, another campaign with a budget of $50 per day. And you can set things like target language and target location. So if, for example, you wanted to have some ads displayed for people within Australia and some ads displayed for people outside Australia, you would need two campaigns with different settings for the target location. Within campaigns, you can have ad groups. And at an ad group level, you can do things like set keyword associations and the bid price. You might have a campaign for um, people within Australia. Within that, you might have an ad group um, for a set one set of keywords and you're willing to pay a certain amount for those keywords. And another ad group for a different set of keywords and you're willing to pay a different amount. And then finally, the ads are at the bottom level. So that's where you define the actual headline and description and destination URL, all of that sort of stuff. So once you've got your ads actually up there, you need to maximize performance. And this is a matter of, <laughs> you've got to get the basics right and tune it. You can't take um, something that isn't working very well and make it work well simply by bolting on some cardboard. You've got to get the fundamentals right. Um, one of the fundamental things that you need to understand is match type. So when you're doing your keyword definition, how do, you, how do those get matched up to the, um, the keywords that people put in when they do their searches? First type is broad match. So when you specify a keyword, you can say, this particular keyword is broad match or whatever. Broad match is basically any use of any word in the phrase in any order. And that's just like a typical Google search. These actually tie in quite neatly with the way Google searches work. Um, phrase match is use of those specific words in that order. So that's like putting a series of words in double quotes in a Google search, and it has to be in exactly those um, in that order without any words in the middle between them, separating them. You can have other words at either end, but that phrase has to be an exact match. In the Google search, does it have to be in quotes, or is it just if some person happens to string those no, words together? No, it just if some person happens to string those words together. So exact match must be just those words in that order with no other words. So you want people that have searched for exactly that, and if they transpose words, you don't want it to match. A negative match excludes all searches that include those words. So you might say, okay, I want everybody that searches for this, but if they include this word, I don't want to know about them. Which sounds a bit strange, but that's a really, really useful modifier. So imagine that you're a company that has invented a write-on vacuum cleaner so that you can get the kids to help with the housework. <laughs> and you want your ads to be shown whenever, whenever someone searches for vacuum. Okay, so lots of people are typing in vacuum. The problem is, half those people are probably looking for pictures from the NASA site because they might be interested in vacuum in space or something. So what you do is apply a broad match on the word vacuum and then a negative match on space. So if someone searches for vacuum in space, your ad won't be shown. So finding good keywords, how do you do it? There are, there are three steps to this. The first one is start small. So just start thinking about words that people use to find the particular products that you're wanting to sell. 
So you just sit there with a bit of paper or a spreadsheet or something and jot them down randomly. Then you need to expand that as much as possible. So go really broad with the key list. And there are some really cool keyword tools that will help you do this. There are sites like um, dictionary.reference.com and thesaurus.reference.com. And there's also a, uh, a keyword tool available um, through the AdWords interface as well, um, the Google Keywords tool. And there's also a really cool site called freekeywords.wordtracker.com which incorporates um, you know, a thesaurus and various other things and it also incorporates data from searches that have been performed so it knows associations between words. So what you can do is stick in your um, key phrase or keyword and um, apply a filter like you can say I don't want any offensive words or whatever and it'll then give you back a whole bunch of words that are associated with it which is cool because you can then simply take those and it will even tell you how many searches have been performed um, in some arbitrary period for those particular words. Now, the number itself doesn't really mean anything because uh, this is historical data. It's not actually what's happening right now, but it gives you some you know, reference point, some scale. So you can see, for example, in this case, we're putting the keyword bagless vacuum to try to find any matching keywords. Its, um, it's top match is best bagless, vac best bagless vacuum with 33 searches, and then compare bagless vacuum cleaners with 26 searches. So those are, are key phrases that you might not have thought of, but they're actually the phrases that people are searching on that are related to this particular keyword. So what you can do is grab a whole bunch of these, stick them in your spreadsheet, so you end up with a really broad list of keywords, so a lot of which you won't have ever thought of um, as a starting point. So then the third stage is refine. You've got a really broad list and you need to narrow it down to just what's important. Because um, the thing is with this, you've got to be really, really accurate with your keywords. <laughs> you can't just take a shotgun approach and, um, and use every keyword you can think of because you get a really, really poor click-through rate. You have to be absolutely spot-on accurate and refine it as much as you possibly can. So you need to be thinking about what users are thinking about. You have to understand what users are searching for and what they're looking for. Now there's a, um, a guy called Glenn Livingston who has done a lot of work in this area. Um, he's pretty well known now as an internet marketing guru. He does a lot of work with researching new markets and trying to determine whether a market is going to be profitable or not uh, based on, um, on whether, what people think about that particular market. And but his background is actually as a clinical psychologist. And um, when he first graduated, one of his jobs was providing counseling to teenagers who were in risk of committing suicide. Um, and one of the things he learned was that when, uh, when a, a patient presented to him, there were really two different ways they could present, and it, they were subtly different, but totally different in terms of ramifications. One patient would present to him and say, um, I'm thinking of committing suicide, I want to talk to someone about it. And another patient would say, I'm afraid I'm going to commit suicide. And the, the difference is, the person who says, I'm thinking about committing suicide still has their brain engaged, they're still thinking about it, they're still mulling it over. They are at a totally different point um, and a different mindset. They haven't been overwhelmed yet. Whereas the person who says, I'm afraid I'm going to commit suicide, has been overwhelmed. They're no longer thinking rationally. The situation has rolled over them. And so the wording was subtly different, but the reaction in terms of how he managed them was totally different. So what he did was took a lot of the lessons that he learned as a clinical psychologist and applied them to market research. And um, one of the things he does is take, um, is do surveys of people who click on keywords. So he would buy um, a whole bunch of, uh, of advertising basically on Google and send people when they click on those ads to a page and he would survey them and say, okay, you clicked on these keywords, what were you thinking about? What questions did you have in your mind? And he did some research on a couple of terms. This is a really cool example. He tried guinea pigs. And the questions that um, people had in their minds were typically, how long do they live? Are they good with kids? Do they buy and what do they eat? And then he also tried guinea pig, singular. The only difference is the S. And the, the questions were, what do they look like? Where do they come from? And how big do they get? So those are two totally different mindsets. The first mindset is obviously parents whose kids have said, Mum, can I have a guinea pig? And so they're wanting to know the practicalities, like do they bite? How do we feed them? What do we look after them? Are they going to die in six months? That sort of thing. The other mindset 
are the kids who are doing a project at school and they've typed in, they want to know how big guinea pigs get and they want to know where they come from and things like that because um, their teacher has said, you know, you need to research some animal. And those are two totally different groups of users and the difference is 1S. So you really need to be very, very careful about, um, about the psychology of the user that types in these particular keywords and what their intentions are and what, what it is that you want. So if you're wanting to sell guinea pigs, obviously you want one type of user and not the other type of user. The other, uh, the other important thing that Glenn talks about is the search continuum. Now this is a, uh, a phenomenon that has been known for a little while, but basically it means people start at a certain place when they begin researching a topic and they learn more as they go. And what he found is that people perform five searches per topic on average. So if you go to Google and you want to research something, most people will perform five searches. Some will do two, some will do seven, typically five. And what happens is that people start with naive terminology. If you are wanting to find out about something that you don't know anything about, you're not an expert, so you go to a search engine and you start typing stuff in. When you begin, you really don't know what you're talking about. You don't even know what to ask for. You don't know what the, the keywords are because you don't understand the terminology of that particular industry. And then as you go, you get search results. The first couple of search results might be you know, a Wikipedia article or something, and, or someone's catalogue. And as you're skimming through it, you'll see terminology and then you'll start to go, oh, okay, and you'll search for that. So as you go over that, those five searches, you become more educated in the space of you know, two or three minutes. So people start off at very early in the continuum um, through to late. And the, the um, traditional uh, way of looking at this is that you want people late in the continuum because they're the ones that are ready to buy. Uh, one of the things that Glenn says is that you need to cater to people all the way across the continuum, but you have to understand the difference and you have to provide lots of educational information to people who are early in the continuum so that they then see you as the expert. Uh, so one example, a couple of days ago we got this new power management system for the servers and came with this massive plug on it and I was trying to figure out how the hell can we plug this thing in inside the rack. It's not a normal power lead. What does this plug into? And it's this big blue thing that's that sort of large with three pins inside it and I didn't even know what it's called. Like how do you find an adapter to plug into that? So the first search I did, because it had 32 amp written on the side of it, was 32 amp power connector. And that got me a whole bunch of results, including Wikipedia article on power adapters around the world and various things like that. And I then found that the terminology for this particular thing, because it had the three pins in it, was that it's a 32A 2P plus E. So that's two phase plus E. Now, I wouldn't have guessed that, but you know, within 30 seconds I knew that that was the terminology for that particular connector. And then having looked at a couple of pictures of these things, I figured out that this particular one that I needed was the female because of the, um, the way the pin alignment goes. So my next search was for 32A 2P plus E female. And that, at that point, I'm a relatively educated searcher. I know what I'm looking for and I'll find matches in you know, parts catalogs and things like that because that's the terminology that is used in the catalogs. When I started two minutes before and I did 32A power connector, I was an uneducated searcher. So that's a, a good illustration of the continuum that people go through as they, as they do research. So the other thing you have to keep in mind about the psychology of use is the difference between the search network and the content network. So results that are displayed in, uh, as it are displayed in a search results page, are shown to users who are actively looking for something. And when someone is looking for something, they can be, um, they can be classified as you know, unsatisfied and focused. So they have a particular need that hasn't been satisfied yet. That's why they're searching. And they're focused, they, they want to achieve this particular thing. They want to answer a question. Whereas the content network users, and this is users that are browsing third party websites with AdSense ads on them, generally are more satisfied. They're not looking for something, they're not seeking something. They're you know, reading an article or whatever. They've achieved something and they are less focused, which means that they are more, uh, more likely to click on ads that talk about things that are related to the topic but are not necessarily directly related to the problem that they had. So the thing is that you must meet the exact needs of search network users. If someone is searching for something, there's no point displaying an ad for something that's related but doesn't meet their need. It has to exactly match what they're searching for. But on the content network, you can have something that, okay, if someone is on this particular, on a, a site with these keywords, they're probably interested in what I have even though it's not directly related. 
So I can go with Ned, that's a bit more broad. So as an example, imagine that you're running a scuba diving shop with training courses and things like that in Maui, and you want to bring in uh, people to your courses. So on the search network, what you can do is run keywords, uh, keyword matches on scuba training Maui, which are really, really specific. So if someone is actually looking for scuba training in Maui, they'll probably type in scuba training Maui and they'll find you. But there's no point trying to have your, um, your ad shown for other keywords or other things like hotels in Maui because if someone's trying to find a hotel, they don't care about other stuff right now. But on the content network, you could match it up with Maui Hotel or Maui Whale Watching or whatever it happens to be. So once someone is, um, is on, say, a Maui Hotel website, then they've probably found, okay, I'm gonna stay here, I'm planning a trip, what else is there that's interesting to do around the place? And then your scuba training ad could be relevant to that particular person. So you have to be laser focused when you're dealing with the search network, but you can be broader dealing with the content network. So once someone clicks on the ad, where do they go? And this is a big mistake that a lot of people make. Don't send visitors to the homepage of the website. That's really rude. If you're advertising something, like say you have an ad for um, scuba training in Maui, and someone clicks on the ad, you don't want to take them to the homepage of a website that is a dive shop, and on the homepage it's all about the specials that they have this week and you know the products that they sell because they're not looking for that. They just clicked on something that talked about scuba training. What you need to do is take them to a landing page that is specific to what they searched on. So take them to a page just about training. And that might only be a, you know, some little sideline of the business that you do, but it has to be related to the ad. So use the destination URL um, and set up a landing page just for, the, for response to that ad. Now, <laughs> AdWords bills. This can be kind of confusing. There are a couple of little things that can really trip you up. So you've got, your campaign's running, you've got ads happening, you've got people coming through to your site. Um, how do you understand the bills? Firstly, billing frequency. When you first sign up with AdWords, it seems like Google send you bills at random times. And the fact is it's not random. What they do is they will send you a bill on one of two conditions, either when you've hit your credit limit or at the end of your 30 day billing cycle, whichever comes sooner. So if you haven't hit your credit limit, then you'll just get a bill every 30 days based on you know, the date you signed up or whatever it happens to be. But if you hit your credit limit, they'll send you a bill straight away. Now that is, it's actually very smart because it's designed to prevent runaway bills. Um, if they simply billed every 30 days and you ran up $10,000 worth of AdWords debt in the first week, then you're in big trouble. So what happens is that once you've hit your credit limit, they send you a bill straight away. And everybody starts with, um, if you're in Australia, a $100 um, credit limit. And then each time you hit your credit limit, it ratchets up. So if you hit your credit limit, they reset your limit to 250. Next time they reset it to 500, then to 1,000, then it stays at 1,000. So every time you run up $1,000 worth of bill of, um, of cost, they'll send you another bill. Once again, it sounds crazy, but it's actually really, really smart because it means that it's basically a back off algorithm. They start by being conservative and then they, they back off so that they send you bills less frequently, but not, um, allow you to run up a huge debt. So that's a good way of keeping things in check. The other thing is that sometimes on your bill you'll find billing summary adjustments and usually they're one of three things. They're usually a, um, a special or a, a discount or a, um, an over delivery credit. You know, an over delivery credit when you first see it you think what the hell is that? Because when ads are run um, Google can't predict exactly how many people are going to click on an ad. So what they do is they will typically over display ads by a, a buffer of up to 20% um, so that they give you the best chance possible of having as many people as you want clicking on your ad. Um, but that means that sometimes if your ad is really popular, more people will click on it than you've actually paid for. But because of the, um, the limit that's in your account, they won't ever charge you for more than any amount. So what happens is that you'll get a bill that says, you know, you've been clicked on um, 23 times at this $1 CPC, so that's $23 on your bill, but your daily limit was $20, so they then give you a $3 adjustment and they only bill you 20 bucks. So it sounds complicated, but once again, um, it's just about making sure that the bill amount reflects the amount that you've agreed to. So, ultimately, your objective is 
you want a high click-through rate, you need to get people clicking on the ad as frequently as possible, which will then push your ads up the rankings. Um, you want high conversion rate, so that you can maximise the profit that you're making from the campaign. And you want a low cost per click, because you want to be paying as little as possible each time someone clicks on your ad. And all that information that I covered today, and a heap more, is in um, Quick Start Guide to Google AdWords, which is at adwords-quickstart.com. Any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank you.